Good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, so, uh, just for those of you who don't know, I'm not uh, Madeline this morning. <laughs> Madeline called me around uh, just a little bit before noon on Friday and told me she was uh, sick and she was had had. Uh, it might possibly be COVID and she was going to get a COVID test. But then yesterday I asked, and she asked me if I'd help this morning, and I said I wouldn't. And she, yesterday she told me that uh, this is what, she wrote this down for me so I can read it. She said, Madeline is out today with what has quite luckily turned out to be a garden variety cold. Her COVID test and flu tests came back negative, and she's looking forward to being with you next Sunday. So we'll hope and pray for that. And I'm glad to be here with you. It's been a while since I've been in the pulpit this morning, but I guess everybody knows me. I, know, I guess I know everybody here, so welcome. Uh, we have a, a few announcements this morning, and I suppose that the people who are going to give announcements probably should come up to one of these speakers. So first, Cindy and and uh, Alan have something to share with us. You'll have to readjust this for yourself. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Um, it's fall. It's NPR fundraising time, which also means it's stewardship season at church. And what we want to do to introduce stewardship this uh, season is begin this this today is to kick off with why do we pledge? And I want to tell you a, a little story. When we first got to Ohio, when our boys, Brad and Ben, were now in the thirties, were four and six, we were looking for a church, and there was this little church around the corner, and we went in. It was the size of Westminster. And we got there and, okay, it was great, it was convenient. We were always late, so it was really convenient. But there was another church in town that Jackie had gone to that had a Sunday school with lots of kids. So we went over there a couple of times. And after we'd gone to this church and that church, we asked the boys, well, do you want to go over to that church that's over by Grandma and Grandpa's that has a Sunday school? And Ben says, no, I want to go to the church around the corner. Well, why? Because the people are friendly. And that's why I pledge to Westminster. The people are friendly. The people I look around, and you are the people that make a difference in my life. Emotionally, spiritually, and in the community. That's why I pledge. Amen. Amen. So we just came off of three days of helping at the shelter, preparing meals, and serving um, some of our friends from the Interfaith Shelter. How many of you people here were part of that three-day? Um, so if you look around, there, there were a number of us that um, helped either prepare meals or serve the last three days. And one of the reasons that I pledge is because I'm always looking, I come from a community back east that really cared about the homeless. We used to, we had a park right outside of our um, church, outside of our front doors, and homeless people used to sit there um, all the time. And um, Dick Avery, who was my pastor at the time, I thought I remember we can talk to him all the time, and we had more than one. <laughs> more than handfuls of people that came into our church because they were invited in. And I'm just used to, I guess, that kind of hospitality, which WPC here in Santa Fe is known for. And so one of the reasons, one of the reasons I pledge is because I really believe in a community that gives back to the community. And um, this church certainly does that, small but mighty. And so, within the coming week, you're going to be receiving a letter from um, the Stewardship Committee, 
And we ask you to prayerfully consider what you might want to pledge so that this community can continue doing what it has been doing for many, many, many years. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then I have a, an announcement that uh, Madeline left me with. It says on November 7th, so I think that's two Sundays after this, November 7th we will celebrate All Saints Sunday. As a part of the worship, we will read the ne necrology, the litany of names of those who have died. Traditionally, the lit litany is for the preceding year. This year, we will read the names of any who have died since November 1, 2019. If you have lost a loved one during that time, regardless of their affiliation with Westminster, please email Madeline, Madeline with their, their names so that we can honor them in worship on November 7th. So keep that in mind and, and if you can find Madeline's email address and send it to the church office. Um, Consuelo has an announcement, I believe, right? Yeah, I did, so, um, you want to, you want to go up there? Okay, you want to hear that. Okay. Uh, just a short announcement. We were hoping that uh, we will have um, celebration and we are going to have a celebration of the solar array in the church uh, but permits here and permits there well we just have to be patient <laughs> so just about everything is done except the counter for the solar that will then be connected to the counter for the regular electricity and once we get connected that way they will be depending on God's will up there <laughs> for energy um, <clears throat> and celebrating the power of nature in creating clean energy. Um, our committee is, is small but it's very powerful um, and uh, we celebrate helping and protecting creation. We also ask we will be asking you, and so be prepared for that, how do you protect creation from your home, from your place, from your work? Uh, and uh, how we look at a bright future despite all the problems we are having with the warming of the earth. Um, I think with God's will and help, we will have a better future and a better world for our children and grandchildren. Uh, just pray for, uh, for everybody, okay? What Cantoyle didn't notice, he didn't mention is that uh, as the uh, meter of the electricity that we're making up there goes one way, the other one goes backwards. <laughs> so, Good morning. Uh, yesterday uh, I went to Albuquerque to visit our friend Carmen in the hospital. And uh, we spent most of the time, she pretty much went through the entire church directory asking how all of you were and what you were doing. And she really, really appreciates the cards. So keep those coming. Um, they don't know what the future holds, so please continue prayer, but she really wanted to be remembered to you, so. Thank you. Madeline left me with another announcement that I should read. I think it's pretty familiar stuff to most of you by now. Westminster session continues to be committed to following the COVID-19 safe protocols for worship. As Christians, we are called to care for the most vulnerable among us. 
while masks and social distancing distance are, certainly help slow the spread of COVID, it is vaccines which do the most. If you have, have not already received a vaccine, we encourage you to do so. If you are unvaccinated, we strongly encourage you to worship with us online. And I hope some people will be seeing us online today and welcome them. You, if you miss them on the way in, please be sure to fill out one of the contact forms in the back, contact tracing forms on your way out the door. These uh, protocols are here to help us keep us and our community safe. We do ask that, you, that everybody abide by them. If for any reason someone feels you can't follow these rules, these mandates, uh, you're welcome to continue worshiping online for now. We know that God walks with us no matter where we go, even when our worship takes place in non-traditional places and spaces and ways. Are there any other announcements? Seeing none. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us worship God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is a familiar hymn to any of you. It is <laughs> Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. cleanse us from all 
unrighteousness. I invite you to prayer, pray silently this ancient prayer that has been used so many times. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Let us pray in silence for a moment. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that we are forgiven and that we can be at peace. Amen. Kathleen is going to read our script. Good morning. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Uh, a reading from Luke 15, 11 to 32. This is the parable of the prodigal and his brother. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property of desolate living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his, feet, uh, his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pots that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him, and was filled with compassion, he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring on a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is, is alive again. He was, he was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has gotten him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. And he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then his father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. Because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Here ends the reading. The 
This parable of Jesus is, is probably one of the best known and most well known of, of any of Jesus' stories. We usually hear it called the story of the prodigal son, uh, sometimes the story of the prodigal son and the loving father, this new revised version uh, entitles it the parable of the prodigal and his brother. So, no matter how we think about it, it's a, it's a pretty important story and you all know it. You've all heard it many times. <clears throat> it was about 55 years ago, believe it or not, that I was assigned to prepare a sermon on this, on this story while I was taking a class at Princeton Seminary <clears throat> on, on pre a preaching class. And I worked on it at that time, and, and uh, I uh, came up with, with a sermon that I call Older Brotherism. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how many people liked it, but I, I did uh, use that sermon for several years. <clears throat> it's been, it's been a par this has been a parable that I have thought about and thought over and rethought uh, for all 40 years that I was in ministry, and, then, and now it's been 11 or 12 years since I retired and still thinking about it. It's a parable of love and loss. It's a parable of faithfulness and response, irresponsibility. It's a parable of redemption and sin. It's a parable of forgiveness and unwillingness to forgive. There are so many sides to this story that someone who listens to the story might be able to find him or herself in, it, in any number of places in this story ourselves. So after thinking about this story all this time, I want to share with you my latest ideas about this story. This sermon, this sermon is entitled, The Mother's View. It's somewhat, in the, this sermon is somewhat in the style of of a Jewish rabbinical midrash. In midrash, uh, they don't speak so much about what's in the scripture, but tell a story that goes along with it to help us understand what's in the story that's in the scripture. And so, that's the way I want to do that this morning. I invite you into this midrash that I'm going to bring you. To get into it, you will need to use your imagination a lot. I, I don't want you to hear my voice. Um, I want you to hear the voice of someone who's not really mentioned in the parable. And that is the voice of a middle-aged woman, probably. She is the character that's never mentioned in the story, and yet she must have been there. And she is the prodigal's mother. So I invite you to listen to her voice, not mine. If it would help you to hear her, go ahead and close your eyes as you listen so you don't see my beard and everything. <laughs> but, but this is her story. I am the one left out of Jesus' parable that usually is called the prodigal son. You may have heard my husband and both of our sons speak in the biblical story, but you have not heard from me. And so today, please listen as I tell my side of the story, the voice of the mother. I look out the gate where my husband is speaking earnestly to our oldest son. He is trying to get him to come into the house for the banquet. Although I can't hear all his words, I know what they are saying. My husband is entreating our, young, our, our older son to join us in the party. My husband is beside himself with joy and our young, that our younger boy has come home, finally returned after all this time. My husband, is pained because our older son won't have anything to do with his brother. He won't even call him by name. He won't even recognize him. Recognize him. He just calls him that son of yours. 
how my husband and I have waited for this day. We have wept, sometimes saying his name, sometimes remembering without words, waiting, hoping against hope that he'll, he would return. It has been so long, I thought we would never see him again. I worried about him as any mother would. I prayed for him every day. What was he doing? We never heard a word. Was he killed by an animal or by a criminal? Was he sick with no one to care for him? The pain was more than I could bear. I asked God to take the pain away from me. What did I deserve for this? Was God punishing me for something? For what? What did I do to deserve this? Couldn't God just take my life? Let me drift away instead of thinking and suffering every minute of every day? But there was never an answer until this morning. Then my husband let out a hoop. There he is! And he went running down the road. I hardly had time to consider what the neighbors must be thinking. Grown men don't run, it's beneath their dignity. <clears throat> After the anguish that we've suffered for so long, we don't really care what the neighbors think anymore. They expressed their opinions years ago when my husband made that fateful decision to let our younger son have his share of the family in inheritance, the share that would have been his when my husband died. When he got his inheritance early, the neighbors wondered what my husband was thinking. I wondered a little bit myself, but my husband felt so grateful to God for our success. Maybe he thought the young one wanted to buy a business, that he wasn't going to be satisfied until he had a chance to start out on his own. So my husband did the unusual thing and let him have one third of the whole property. <clears throat> We soon found out what a mistake that was. He was too young to be wise. But before he knew, but, but before we knew what was happening, he sold everything my husband had given him, what we had worked for for years to build up. Then he was gone. We saw him heading east with his money tied up in a little bundle. He disappeared over the hill. How we cried. Over the years, our tears dried up, but the intensity of the feeling was always there. It moved to the pits of our stomachs and into our bowels. Our neighbors were no help. They wagged their heads. What could you expect after all? That boy was only a kid. He had no brains, no wisdom. He wasted all that money. Our neighbors were right. Their opinions were, but their opinions were so strong that they hardly dared to share our feelings. And we hardly dared to share our feelings with them or anyone anymore. They all blamed my husband, and I couldn't bear to hear any more of it. So I had to avoid our friends and neighbors. But this morning, that all changed. We looked out and we saw him. He's back. He looks awfully skinny. His clothes are the most ragged and dirty sight I've ever seen. What has he been doing? Working in the fields? Tending animals? What did he do? with all that money. Such a pitiful sight. But we are so overjoyed. 
It's no wonder my husband had the very best clothes brought out for our son. He sent him off immediately to take a bath, to get his hair and his beard trimmed, and to put on very special clothes. My husband also called a huge party, a party for the whole village. So the big calf that we were fattening for up for the next holiday was slaughtered. All the neighbors were invited, even those who had been critical and wagging their heads at us. When I see what my husband is doing, I think he is reflecting the love of God. We know that God loves unconditionally, a love that is not dependent on what anyone thinks, thinks God ought to do. God cares for all of us, even when we forget Him. God offers forgiveness to those who may never deserve it. God grieves for the lost and is always ready to welcome them home. Surely God understood our grief and our present joy. But we don't compare ourselves to God. God would never have done anything so foolish as to test a youngster with so much property. But look, there's my husband now, still trying to convince our older son to come in and join the party. He's not coming. That boy. Really, he's a good boy, but sometimes I wonder. He seems to have no imagination. He works so hard that it's difficult for him to even have any friends or diversions. He puts so much, such long hours into his work that he's totally exhausted. I can hardly get him to take time to rest on the Sabbath day. He is totally immersed in the work of our farm. Does he feel enslaved here? Like the farm is running him? But he is so dedicated and so frugal with the way he always talks about his younger brother. I wonder if he secretly wishes that he could be like him. If he wishes he could sell the farm shove all his possessions into a knapsack and go out and blow it all. Why would anyone who has such advantages as he does want to do that? But jealousy is a strange partner, isn't it? He doesn't seem interested enough in girls to, to find a wife, but he acts so jealous that his, his brother might have been with prostitutes. What is a mother to do? He makes me cry. I pray for him. I pray for both of them. I find myself wishing that the good boy weren't quite so good, that he were a little more daring, that he would take a few more risks, that he had a few more interests do I wish he were a little more like his younger brother? It's hard to say that, but I do cry for him. And then I cry for my wayward son. Why couldn't he be a little more responsible, a little more like his older brother? So here we are. It should be the happiest days day of our lives, the younger boy got tired of living with the animals. He was so hungry and even eating the pig's food, and the Gentiles didn't care for him. He was a poor stranger in their midst. He was hungry and cold. It was as bad as I had imagined. He had no one to worship with. There was no Torah to read no one to sing a psalm with. But one day something happened to him. It must have been God speaking to him, reminding him of that deep memory of home. 
God heard my prayer and reached out to him to give him a vision of home. He says he prayed that he could come back and be one of the hired servants. He knows he has humiliated his family and he has no right to be a part of the family again, yet he took the risk to come back just to see if he could get a job here. I don't know what our neighbors think now. They didn't get a chance to say anything. Instead, my husband, who has suffered so long with the guilt and the shame, just like me, went running out to greet him, to welcome him home, and to pre prepare a party, like we would give a party like we would give if there was a new bride coming into our family. So it should be the happiest day of our lives. Look, look out here at our firstborn. He's got his lips stuck out, his face is a huge skull, a cloud hangs over him. There is no happiness around him. I wish wish my husband could make him understand to help him feel. I still hope my husband, husband can loosen him up and help him rejoice too. His brother isn't home to grab the inheritance. He just came back to be treated like a human being with human love. It's like he was dead all these years and now he's alive again. It's like he was lost, and now he's found. Why can't his brother feel that? This older one has been here all the time. He has never missed a week in the synagogue. Even when he was so busy, he has fulfilled his religious obligations, though sometimes I wonder if his heart was in it. Sometimes it seems like he's miles away. I wish that God would speak to him the way God spoke to his wayward brother, that he would feel the arms of God's love, that he would know God's forgiving love, that he would know that he lives by the grace of God as much as his younger brother does. I thank God for the gift of my two boys. I have prayed so long and hard for the wayward one. Today I thank God for his return. But now I pray for my steady one. I pray that he can experience the gift of God and the gift of his, new bro of his brother's new life. I pray that he won't drift farther and farther away. Life is not easy for parents. May God bless our family. So as we conclude this session with the mother, I wonder who in this story you have identified with? The mother? The youngest son? The older son? Father, the neighbors, let us pray. Teach us, O oh God, by the stories of the scripture, particularly the stories of Jesus used. Help us to live faithfully as his disciples. Amen. next hymn is God of the Sparrow.
The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Our lives as Christians are marked by the ways we offer ourselves to God. In worship, we remember that God claims us and sets us free. In response to God's love in Christ, we offer our lives, our gifts, our abilities, and our material goods for God's service. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. If you are watching online, I invite you to gather your offering and prepare it to be delivered to the church. Write a check, put a stamp on an envelope, drop it in a post box. For those of you here in the sanctuary, you're invited to drop your offering in either plate on the communion table as you leave this space. Let us pray. Redeeming Lord, we continually seek your comfortable refuge. You deliver us from our unfounded fears and provide us with miraculous examples of your love. In response, we offer these gifts. We pray that these funds will provide an outreach that warms people with your resplendent love. As a church community, we exalt and praise your holy name. Amen. As we offer our prayers this morning, I'm sure and keep Madeline in our prayers and Carmen and others who have been mentioned in the seminario. Are there any other prayers that any of you have that we should be remembering? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, Gay, Hansen, and me, they moved to. I don't remember the name of the state, but as they were, the hospital uh, is uh, served by one of his sons-in-law, a medical doctor, and they have, because he's in the board, you know, he has extremely good service. Well, Gay took advantage of that, moved with Mimi up there, and uh, he has two brand new knees now. So he's been going through, you know, the pain and also the recovery, and uh, they are getting ready to move back here. Uh, but Gay just got um, vessels that broke behind his one of his eyes, so he's recuperating for that because right now he cannot see on no one eye. Uh, but they bought a house over there. They like it so much. So now they are going to be, you know, like winter birds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I go back and forth, so let's pray for, for both of them. We'll remember, remember Gabe and me. Yeah. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you know our prayers before we speak them. You know the prayers there are on our hearts. We pray for Madeline and for, for Carmen and for Gabe and Mimi and all the others that have been lifted up in, in prayer silently or in the newsletter. We pray your hand of healing on, on them and upon all of those who suffer at this time. We thought that COVID was going to be over in a half a year and now it's stretching into the far into the second year. Oh God, give us patience and, and give wisdom to those who are caring for the ill and, and the needy and give wisdom to those who, who are resisting the vaccines and the, and the care that we need to take for one another. I pray for us as, as a nation, and as a world, Pray especially for the leaders of the world that you will give them guidance and wisdom that they might guide us in the ways of hope and justice and love and peace. We pray for those who are hungry, especially in those places in the world where there is famine and, and lack, lack of food and water. We pray for, pray for them. Pray for all the churches as we are trying our best to do whatever we can to be your faithful disciples. We
Pray for those members of the church who tries who try always to be faithful and to follow your commandments and your laws. Teach us, O oh God, that we might be might faithfully uh, be your disciples and, and be your faithful church. And now let us say together what words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This last hymn is O Christ the Healer. I didn't recognize the title, but I think you'll recognize the music.